Hello and welcome back to Compressible Flow. I'm Professor Steve Miller. Today we'll be talking about our last major class in isentropic flow module. We will look at and introduce the concepts of supersonic wind tunnels and their analysis through isentropy. Then we'll look at a particular part of the supersonic wind tunnel of interest, which is of course the diffuser. We'll look at how these tunnels start up and shut down with our isentropic theory, and we'll have to of course talk a little bit about the shocks that might exist in their tunnel. We'll return to the supersonic wind tunnel case with shocks later in the class too. We'll then define the particular efficiency of the wind tunnel through the diffuser, which is of course where many of the losses occur. Then we'll transition our class to shockwave theory. Let's get started. It's fun to start with a quote. Here we are with Werner von Braun once again, who of course led NASA through the Apollo program and worked in Germany during World War II to develop the V1 and V2 rockets. He was truly the pinnacle and point, the spearhead, if you will, of the American rocket program through NASA and our success in going to space and of course landing on the moon. He wrote through the New York Times in an interview, basic research is what I am doing when I don't know what I'm doing. I sometimes think about that when I'm totally lost in my own research and perhaps when students are learning material in classes for the first time. Usually post and show in video in class a particular supersonic wind tunnel demonstration from the University of 20. Here you'll see a video demonstration of a startup of a particular wind tunnel with shocks in it. We don't have shock theory yet explained within the class, but it's an illusion of what we'll see soon. It's very much impossible to really start up a supersonic wind tunnel without shocks in practice. Here's one picture of a supersonic wind tunnel. This is the six by six foot supersonic wind tunnel of NASA Ames Research Center located in California. The six by six in figure 97 caption of this slide deck indicates the cross-sectional area of the wind tunnel, which is indicated by two in this particular figure. So this is a drawing of the original building before its construction by the architect. Of course, you have a control room located near the test section. So this is of course the test section where we mount the models. This is a recirculating supersonic wind tunnel meaning the circuit is closed. In some of the undergraduate classes which you might be taking you often use open circuit wind tunnels because of course they might be a little bit cheaper because they contain less material. Some lucky students will learn on a closed circuit tunnel. Now this particular tunnel is driven by a compressor located out at five and there's a particular drive motor which drives the compressor. The air recirculates. In the majority of the tunnel, the flow is actually subsonic. And in the test section, it's driven through a series of converging, diverging ducts, which is the wind tunnel wall, which we discussed in the previous classes, to accelerate and choke the flow to supersonic speeds. Then at the exit of the test section, there's a second convergent, divergent, tube or wind tunnel duct to deaccelerate the flow from supersonic to subsonic speeds. This is just like a subsonic wind tunnel which generally only uses contractions and then diffusers to speed up the flow and slow it down at different subsonic speeds. Here the test sections must actually ideally change their cross-sectional area ratios to achieve different Mach numbers in the test section. And this should of course be obvious to you now because you know about the famous Mach number area relation and equation. Let's get started with some of these and look at more examples. Here's one picture in figure 98 of a particular compressor. You can see the blades open which consist of a system of rotors and stators. The inner blades are turning, the outer blades are stationary. That's why we call them rotors and stators respectively in the turbo machinery terminology. This is for one particular supersonic wind tunnel which is undergoing maintenance. Of course this whole door closes over the device and all these blades intermingle in a turbo machinery framework to compress the flow. Here in this case compression and compressors are designed only to raise the pressure of the flow. This way we can at very low speeds raise the static and or stagnation pressure so that we can maintain it through the circulation in the tunnel as it circulates, as recirculating the tunnel, 
back to the face of the test section. Here's one particular photo of the interior of the NASA Glenn Research Center 8x6 test section. NASA Glenn Research Center is located in Cleveland, Ohio. In fact, I have a picture of myself in this very tunnel, which has been redone in my office. If you come to office hours, you're welcome to stop by and check it out. Here we see a particular model mounted in the tunnel with some technicians, of course, uh, wearing protective suits because they're gonna be running some chemistry in this tunnel. Um, to model the plumes of these rockets. This is really a supersonic type tunnel which also can operate in the transonic regime. You might wonder why are all these holes in the wall and we'll talk about this specifically when we get to the transonic section. And can, until then maybe you can think of an idea of why these holes are there. Here's another wonderful example of a supersonic wind tunnel in earlier design and in this case this is at the Jet Propulsion Lab of Caltech. You can get the size of this moderate scale, not large scale, a large scale supersonic tunnel and you might be able to walk down like in the previous picture. This one I call moderate scale because it's on the order of maybe half a human height, maybe five, three to five feet max or less. And a maybe university or small scale supersonic tunnel might be on the order of inches in test section cross section. Here to the left of these gentlemen, is where the test section is. You can see there's a little window here which allows the Schlieren mirrors to operate. The light goes in the cross stream direction in the tunnel. The mirrors aren't shown here but we'll look at them later again in the class. Now this is the tunnel wall. This vertical wall is stationary. There's another wall which clamps down and is bolted on to the surface where my mouse is moving. Now you might see this lower and upper wall are actually metal plates and they can be moved and driven by these hydraulic rods and so these rods push and pull uniformly to create these different shapes of the metal plates on the top and bottom. In this way the technicians according to the engineer's calculations, can change the cross-sectional area with, of course, axial distance. And this is how they change the variation of the flow and Mach number in the test section. For example, if they want to change the test section Mach number from, say, 1.5 to 2, they might have to change the area ratio A over A soup star from the throat of the test section of the wind tunnel. This is how we vary the test section Mach numbers in wind tunnels in practice. Now there's also a second set of these on the opposite side of the tunnel which represents the diffuser which deaccelerates the flow from supersonic speeds to subsonic speeds. These are some historic photos but of course these tunnels all operate on the same principles today. Of course some wind tunnels in the United States and other governments you can't take photos of because of their classified nature of their work. Let's look at a basic schematic of the perfect or ideal supersonic tunnel and its operating condition. So this is not start up or shut down, but the ideal isentropic operation. Of course, in reality, there's always systems of shocks and expansions and turbulence. But if our wind tunnel was perfect in every way and we had isentropic flow, this is what we would ideally have. In this case, this is an open wind tunnel. It's not a recirculating wind tunnel because the flow moves from left to right and it discharges and is injected into the entrance of the wind tunnel from the ambient environment. There's certainly supersonic wind tunnels like this and there's certain advantages for these types of wind tunnels versus recirculating wind tunnels. And we can talk more about that in our one-on-one -on -one sessions if you so desire. In this case, these lines represent the outside areas of the wind tunnel and their distance apart represents just a rough estimate of the cross-sectional area with variation from the airflow direction from front to back. Now you'll see in this case we might have an air supply. It could be coming from a compressor or a large bottle field which of course holds compressed air. We'll look at pictures of those later in this very class. It represents a so-called settling chain chamber. So just like in the nozzle problems which you looked at previously, we had high 
pressure air in this region. We might also very much want to remove the humidity of the air, and there might be a dehumidifier in here. We might also want to heat the air, and we might do that through a combustion process or maybe with an electric heating for moderate temperatures. Nonetheless, just like in the nozzle plenum, or problem, which you looked at previously, it's all very, very low speed moving air. So we say the Mach number, which we remember is the ratio of the velocity divided by the local speed of sound, will be very, very close to zero. It'll be much less than one. We'll allow this wind tunnel to start operating by opening a valve somewhere that allows the air to move down the tunnel. And you can see this is nothing but a fancy variation of the nozzle problem. But it combines our basic isentropic flow theory. The air will move from left to right and it will be choked at the nozzle throat at m equals 1. The air will then expand through a test section Right? So the air goes from subsonic through a choked or transonic flow, and it'll expand supersonically through our test section. The test section might be where we put our instrumentation and take measurements of the airflow, drag, lift, etc. on a test article. We then allow the flow to go through a diffuser. It is inefficient to let our flow exhaust to the atmosphere supersonically. There's no real reason why we can't just cut off the rest of the device, but it's much much easier to have a recirculating tunnel in terms of power savings, which we'll talk about in this class and future classes with wind tunnels. The idea here is we've got to take the supersonic flow and deaccelerate it to the lowest speed possible while raising our thermodynamic properties as much as possible. For this reason, we put a diffuser at the end of a wind tunnel. It's the same concept that you learned in your previous classes with respect to diffusers for recirculating wind tunnels, and of course in your laboratory classes. Here the diffuser shows that we would want to once again have its supersonic flow and to slow it down we need to decrease the area. This is, remember, unlike a subsonic flow, where decreasing the cross-sectional area in a streamwise direction would actually accelerate the flow. Remember, supersonically, decreasing the area will slow down the flow and will re-choke the flow at m equals 1. Once this happens, of course, the duct will start diverging again, because we're transonic again, and will deaccelerate the flow to lower speeds. You might ask yourself, well, if we go from supersonic speeds to Mach 1, and then open it up the cross-sectional area again, why wouldn't the flow accelerate back supersonically? And of course, the answer is multiple reasons. One is how we start the tunnel. Two is this particular back pressures downstream, which dictate what the flow will be downstream. Just like in our nozzle problem where our normal shock forms, in order to match the particular back pressure of the device. If this opens up to the atmosphere, the back pressure of this particular supersonic tunnel will be, of course, P sub infinity, the static pressure measured in the atmosphere by a particular barometer. Let's look at these types of test sections. You can see now that the supersonic wind tunnel operations are nothing more than a string tube or duct with varying cross-sectional areas with two particular throats, ideally. At minimum, you have to have at least one to become supersonic from the plenum. But of course, you want to have a second throat. So we'll start analyzing, with the isentropic flow theory, these types of problems. So we might say to ourselves, if we're given a duct with two particular areas, which we show in figure 102 of this slide deck, what are the possible isentropic flow conditions we might obtain if we're assuming that the total pressure is fixed and there's a variable back pressure? So in this particular case, we might imagine that there is indeed a total pressure up here in the plenum to the left of the entrance of our variable stream tube, and it's held constant. The back pressure is measured after the exit of the tunnel or variable area, variable area stream tube. We'll call that PB or P sub infinity, the back pressure that the flow exhausts to. We once again see we have a variable area cross section with increasing axial direction. In this particular case, let's assume that A sub 2 is greater than A sub 1. A sub 1 is the cross sectional area at the first throat. A sub 2 is the cross-sectional area at the second throat, which is, of course, at the diffuser. So there's a nozzle and diffuser in the supersonic wind tunnel phenomena and terminology. We'll call these A1 and A2 respectively. 
let's look at the case where a2 is greater than arrow 1. So once again, we'll define as an x-axis, and the vertical dashed lines will correspond to the locations of the first and second areas. The horizontal lines will dictate and show the locations of the total pressure from the plenum. And remember, this is isentropic, so the total or stagnation pressure is constant through the whole flow. This is a huge assumption for, of course, supersonic wind tunnels, but it is impossible to devise a device with these characteristics if it's operating at one particular condition. This, of course, remember from our previous lectures, we showed and demonstrated that there's only one supersonic solution for the isentropic flow problems in these types of devices. We'll then show a P sup star value, which happens at A1, which is the choked value. So you see, if we held P0 and lower PB, the back pressure, the pressure ratio will increase until, of course, the flow is choked. The flow will always choke at the first smallest area, which in this particular case is A1. So let's look at the first case where, say, the total pressure is only the ratio of total pressure and back pressure is small. This would be where we never choke the flow at one and we have subsonic flow through the whole duct framework. That means the static pressure would go down a tiny bit and it would come up because we accelerate again and it would go down again because we're accelerating and it would come up again because we're deaccelerating. This is the subsonic flow. We've never choked the flow and became supersonic. The second case, of course, is where we choke the flow. We might raise the ratio of, say, P0 divided by PB, the total pressure divided by the back pressure, just enough to choke the flow. At that instant, we have accelerated our flow, and it's choked at A1, and then it deaccelerates again because this divergent part of the nozzle slows down the flow because it's subsonic and we return to a subsonic condition. And then we have another converging diverging duct, but it's subsonic and it can't possibly choke the flow because A1 is greater is less than A2, and it'll accelerate and deaccelerate again just like a regular subsonic flow. The third case is where I raise the pressure ratio once again, P0 over PB, and in this particular case, I'm able to choke the flow and then go supersonic through the test section and then I go through my second converging diverging diffuser and I lower velocity again so I recover pressure and the velocity goes up again, Mach number, and I lower the pressure again. So you can see this is three possible cases just for one particular A2 greater than A1 for a duct with two particular constrictions which are unequal. So you can see for ducts with multiple constrictions you should always look for the smallest. Why? Because that will choke first. Now, to be able to control the flow in the wind tunnel, you might find it advantageous to change the areas of these particular nozzles and diffusers. That's why in this particular figure in 100, we see these hydraulic rams being able to change the minimum area ratio where my cursor is moving. Also, you should remember that a restriction of the area does not mean the flow is transonic. If the pressure ratios between the front and back of your stream tube are not large enough, you can never achieve supersonic flow. That is, no matter what, if you don't hit the critical pressure uh, ratio, say P star over P naught to a function of the gamma powers, then you can never achieve a supersonic flow no matter what you do within your nozzle. Your temperature ratios have no bearing on achieving supersonic flow, as we showed in our previous equations in isentropy. Let's look into the second case. In this case, it's very much like the previous one, except of course we make the important change of saying the second area at two is equal to the first area of one. Let's assume the flow is isentropic and we can vary the total pressure in the plenum to the left of one and maybe also vary P infinity. It doesn't matter which one we vary, the ratio is what matters. So let's say in this case we'll have P not fixed, the total pressure is fixed in the plenum which is out to the left and the ambient or back pressure P sub B or P infinity is variable. In this case, 
Let's say that the ratio is very small. We'll always have subsonic flow. But as soon as we hit the critical condition, that is the critical pressure ratio, it's 1.89 for gamma 1.4, you can check yourself, you'll find that we do indeed, once again, choke the flow at A1 and choke the flow again at A2. We choke the flow at both locations based, of course, of the same areas. We have the same minimum area. You might imagine if we have isentropic flow and we have four or five cross-sectional minimal areas that are all the same, that we could choke the flow at every location. And between every one, we can, if we wish, control if it's subsonic or supersonic. In this case, there is indeed four possible solutions. Let's look at them. In each case, they start and go through and choke to the same value. The first solution will, of course, take the flow from Mach 0 to the transonic condition, and it will become subsonic through the test section, and it will reaccelerate back to the transonic condition, and it will become subsonic. The second case is the same. We can go down the same solution and choke the flow, become subsonic, accelerate to the transonic condition, and become supersonic. The third case has supersonic flow through the test section, and the diffuser works wonderfully and deaccelerates the flow back to the back pressure one subsonically. And the fourth case takes the flow, it accelerates the transonic condition, becomes supersonic in the test section, it rechokes the flow, and becomes, of course, supersonic once again at the exit of the device that is the diffuser. So you can see two solutions must be recovered by one particular back pressure, and the other two solutions are recovered by the other particular back pressure. So you see, having supersonic flow with choked entrance and exit of the duct section is a non-unique solution. There's two and they depend on the particular back pressures for isentropic flow. This is unlike the nozzle problem, of course. In the other case, we have two solutions where we have choked flow, where we have subsonic flows, corresponding to M less than one in the test section, which is in the middle of the device. So you can see, in summary, if A2 equals A1, A1 chokes and so does A2 in isentropic flows. There's actually, of course, four different pressure curves, as we showed, for Mach 1 flow somewhere in the flow, because, of course, there's two noses. You'll also note that if we never choke the flow, there's an infinite number of subsonic solutions where the pressure and the flow never chokes through the device. There'll be an infinite number of solutions. And so you should never use the A over A sub star Mach number relations with area in these particular problems, because if it's a subsonic flow, that is. Let's look at these once again. In this case, I've broken out the two solutions for the subsonic flow and the supersonic tunnel. There's very little point in running a supersonic tunnel like this. There's lots of subsonic tunnels in the world and not as many supersonic tunnels. It's much better and maybe cheaper for you to book and use a subsonic tunnel. And you have more control over it. The supersonic case, of course, is much more interesting. When we, of course, look at these particular problems. Of course, in reality, starting the tunnel to get this condition will contain shocks, which we've kind of alluded to before, and we'll discuss these particular problems later. Let's look at the third case. What if the second area is less than the first area? You will see, of course, as you raise the pressure ratio of P naught over the back pressure ambient pressure, that's a pressure ratio, P naught over PB, you'll see that A sub 2 indeed must choke first. Otherwise, and before choking, you'll always have subsonic flow. So as you raise the pressure ratio, you'll choke the flow, and then you'll have a series of particular supersonic isentropic solutions, if you can achieve them, which is, of course, rather difficult. You can see that in these cases, the back pressure can end up rather high, as shown in PB1, or rather low in PB2. So once again, there's four particular isentropic solutions. Now over here on the left, we show once again the x direction as the axis of the tunnel shown above, and the y direction is a variation of pressure P. 
Now, the inlet of the nozzle is never choked, so if we have subsonic flow coming in, we'll start out at a subsonic condition, and we never choke the flow to get to the transonic condition, so we never get to P star. So P goes down a tiny bit, and then we level out for M less than one, and we have subsonic flow throughout, and then we choke the flow at two, so that's the A2 soup star condition, and then we deaccelerate de subsonically back to PB1. In the second case, what if we start out supersonically and have another isentropic solution? We might go along and raise the pressure a bit because our flow, what does it do? It slows down, and then it speeds up to supersonic speeds, and then we come back down and choke the flow once again, and then we accelerate back to, of course, PB2. This is all very interesting, and you might imagine here, once again, that there's four possible solutions. We could be subsonic, come to the transonic condition, and deaccelerate or accelerate to PB1 or PB2, or vice versa, we might state supersonically and go to the transonic condition, then deaccelerate or accelerate to PB1 or PB2, respectively. So you can see there's actually four isentropic solutions for this particular confusing case. Nonetheless, you can see how we can start to build series of variations of cross-sectional area. And these types of problems inspired aerodynamicists from the 1920s through the 1950s and 60s to think of exterior, exterior aerodynamics problems as a series of infinite variational area stream tubes where fluid parcels are bounded by the stream tubes going over particular aerodynamic bodies. It's a beautiful way to think about the problem and is a very physical approach because of course it corresponds directly to the stream tube theory of isentropy which we developed. Let's now look at of course the mass flow rate versus the exit pressure of the particular device. You'll see in this particular case, on the x-axis, I have a variation of pressure. On the y-axis, I have mass flow rate m dot. The bottom axis represents the exit pressure of these particular devices. Pb is the back pressure. P0 is the total pressure. If we're in isentropic flow, remember P0, the total pressure, is constant through the flow. If Pb equals P0, then of course the value of the ratio of Pb over P0 is 1. That is represented at this point. As we lower the back pressure and hold the total pressure constant in an isentropic flow, the flow of course will accelerate through the tunnel. As we lower the back pressure, we will eventually reach some exit pressure, which is P3. That's very interesting. And then as you see, the mass flow rate increases as we lower the back pressure. So as we lower the back pressure, the flow accelerates, and the value of the Mach number will keep going down on the graph, the corresponding Mach number. So the, going to the left on this graph represents flow at higher velocities. Now you'll see what happens is once we hit the choked condition, it levels off a bit, and then right here, at the particular critical value of P0 over Pb, which is constant for air, 0.528, you'll find that indeed the mass flow rate, which is represented on the y-axis, never increases. And that's why we show that this distance for a particular m dot is a choked flow. This is the exact principle of the original flow meter designs of the De Laval company, which I showed in a previous lecture. You can see that they choked the flow to control exactly mass flow rate in their valve system, which is nothing but a convergent nozzle which chokes the flow inside a piping system separated by butterfly valves. They raise the pressure high enough and know the exact mass flow rate because they know they've choked the flow. Nonetheless, if I lower my back pressure even more, all the way to the ambient environment, I can only have a constant mass flow rate. This is absolutely true in the wind tunnel problems we just looked at too. Our mass flow rate through the tunnel, no matter how high the Mach number is and how large the back pressure is, ratio, the pressure ratio is, excuse me, then we'll only have a particular mass flow rate. That's a very counterintuitive but important physical phenomena to remember, and it applies in so many other situations. For example, in a previous class, I showed you the puncture in the International Space Station. They only achieved a constant mass flow rate out of the station through a tiny hole, which goes as rho star, u star, a star. Here's some additional thoughts about these particular problems. 
First of all, nozzle walls must be designed correctly to main isentropic flow. I've shown earlier in this class particular schlieren of nozzles with straight walls in the divergent section. You saw that there's disturbances coming off the walls. Indeed, in real supersonic wind tunnels and any supersonic device, if it's not designed perfectly for that one supersonic solution, then of course you are not going to be able to account on truly isentropic flow. It is really, in reality, an engineering assumption. In any high speed flow in engineering, there's very likely to be turbulence which represent losses, and you cannot make the isentropic assumption for those cases either. This means that the shapes of the walls in your supersonic wind tunnels, in your engines, in your propulsion systems, in any device where you achieve supersonic flow and any meaningful compressibility, the shapes of the walls must be designed carefully. They can cause shocks to form which create tremendous losses in entropy, excuse me, increases in entropy and losses in your isentropy assumption breaks down. There's one particular method which we'll talk about later in this class to design walls of nozzles so that they do not generate shocks. That is the so-called and celebrated method of characteristics, which of course comes from the theory of partial differential equations. I think many people in this class will find it challenging, including myself. Now there are select companies in the world that specialize in building wind tunnels. I've been fortunate to have a few of my students and colleagues go to these companies. There's only a couple of them, and the people in them have spent their lives in the art of designing and creating, and even sometimes modifying, through large grants and contracts, wind tunnels, through their research and company designs. Every wind tunnel is often very specialized for its task. Uh, there's very few generalized wind tunnels anymore. And that's because they're so expensive to run. In fact, there's less and less wind tunnels in the world because of the advent of computational CFD. That is using computers to solve the equations of motion numerically, and they of course replace some wind tunnels. But I think you'll find, if you talk to experts today, they'll all say there will be always a place for wind tunnels in the world. And there's a lot of reasons for that which we can talk about later. In fact, I sometimes teach an introduction to CFD class where we go into these issues and show why CFD is sometimes limited and we need wind tunnel testing even today. These people in the business of wind tunnel design are often sought after and they have become experts in their field. I suggest going into the field if you feel that you're up to it. Let's now look at a few examples for fun. This one reads, a supersonic wind tunnel is designed a Mach 2.5 flow in the test section. That means we want to achieve Mach number U over C of 2.5 where we test the model. We want to achieve this at standard sea level conditions. That means the pressure and temperature should be about 101, 325 pascals and about eh, 273 Kelvin is a good number. We'll use the basic isentropic theory, which we use in this class, and our now knowledge of the physics of wind tunnels, to try and calculate the exit area and conditions necessary to achieve these design goals. We need to find the exit area of the particular tunnel and conditions to achieve these goals. Think about that. So what we can do is we can go to our isentropic tables, which we showed previously, and look up Mach number of 2.5. From Mach number 2.5, you can use the Mach number area relation equations or look up the table row and you'll find that A over A sup star is 2.637, P naught over P is 17.09, in this case P naught is the stagnation pressure in the tunnel and the plenum, and P will write as PE, the exit pressure. We'll find a value of 17.09. Finally, you'll find a stagnation temperature, T naught over the temperature E, that is T in the tables, of 2.25. That's the temperature ratio. Remember, T naught is also constant through the isentropic tunnel. Let's assume that we want to have one atmosphere, as stated in the problem, and 288 Kelvin, excuse me, I wanted 273, but the problem wants 288 Kelvin, that's fine, in the tunnel section. Now, I'll use my pressure ratios at Mach 2.5, and I'll use my temperature ratios at Mach 2.5 with the ambient conditions of an atmosphere in 288 Kelvin to find the total pressure and temperature needed within the tunnel. This means in the plenum upstream of the nozzle inlet going into the tunnel, I'll need a total pressure of 17 atmospheres and a temperature of 648 Kelvin. What does this mean? I need to have a large plenum in front of my tunnel 
that maintains a pressure of 17 times the atmosphere. That means my compressor needs to take air from the outside and raise it to 17 times the atmospheric pressure. And I need to have a heating system and heat the air in the plenum to have a stagnation temperature of 648 Kelvin. I might be able to do that with electric heating or I might need a combustion process to heat the air in the tunnel. What does this mean? This means that ideally our stagnation properties are defined at the inlet and the back static pressures are ambient values. So this tunnel, of course, with PE and TE, we should replace those with P sub infinity and T sub infinity, meaning those are the ambient pressures and temperatures respectively, which of course are the temperatures of the day. So you can see some days might have higher pressures and temperatures like hot days and cold days respectively. And we would need to raise the total pressure and total temperature in the plenum to different values. Therefore, every day I do a test, I'll have to redo this calculation to make sure, of course, I have the right actual stagnation values and pressures within the plenum. Ideally, these are the conditions I need to find. Now, if we have a recirculating tunnel, this may not be the best, because, of course, the conditions are only used closely and approximately, and we'll have to adjust them as the tunnel runs. Can you think of particular conditions or tunnel types or things that happen in the tunnels which would break down the simple isentropic theory? We'll get to those in the next modules of the class. Let's now turn our attention to diffusers. Now diffusers in subsonic flow are designed to lower the velocity and raise the pressures and temperatures and recover our energy enthalpy. Diffusers, the same device in a supersonic flow, actually accelerate the flow. They diffuse the flow. They're expanding it. They're not recovering the static values. In fact, in supersonic flow, they're taking the enthalpy and converting it into kinetic energy in terms of thermodynamics. If we discuss the mathematical and physical reasons for these facts, which you should now understand and be able to explain. So here, the diffuser's goal is still always to slow down the flow with little losses as possible. In our diffuser of a supersonic wind tunnel, we must re-choke the flow and then recompress it, just like, of course, the diffuser in a traditional subsonic flow. In figure 108, I've shown a supersonic wind tunnel test section. In this case, you'll note the test section is at Mach 1, and we have a total pressure which chokes the flow at AT1, and we have our test section, and then we have a second converging diverging duct where we re-choke the flow at AT2, the second throat, and we ideally have subsonic flow afterwards. Ideally, this works from a supersonic to subsonic flow, and we, at the exit of the diffuser, we exactly match the static pressure with the ambient pressure, ideally if it's isentropic. Now unfortunately, diffusers are not working this way in practice, especially when we put devices in the tunnel. Even if you design a perfect isentropic tunnel, once you put a device in it, it'll create losses and systems of shocks and losses and turbulence, and this will mess up our whole diffuser framework. So we must face the possibility of having non-isentropic flow through our diffuser in practice in all applications. You'll see in this figure I've drawn little dots and these might represent the particular losses going to diffuser and supersonic flow of characteristic waves, which we go through maybe a little throat and might even have shock in the diffuser part of the tunnel, which is the second converging diverging duct. And of course we have Mach lesson one. What is the efficiency of types of diffusers? How can we calculate those where many of the losses in the tunnels occur? We'll look at the efficiency of the diffuser, and these are critical for supersonic wind tunnel operations. And we'll define our diffuser efficiency in the traditional sense of supersonic wind tunnels. We will use our isentropic theory to define this particular efficiency. And in the theory of supersonic wind tunnels, and in practice, you'll see efficiency is not necessarily like a percentage defined from zero to one. So don't be bothered if we find efficiencies that are higher or lower than one. It's simply because of the way the community defines supersonic def diffuser efficiency. The efficiency of the diffuser I'll introduce and define as eta sub capital D. 
a to sub capital D, D is our diffuser efficiency. And that's an equation 291. We'll write that that diffuser efficiency goes as PD over P naught of what we measure, the actual, divided by PO2 divided by PO1 where a normal shock resides at the tunnel exit. Now in practice, in practice in supersonic tunnel operations, there's a normal shock, a shock wave which forms in the diffuser, which we'll talk more about in the next model. For now, please bear with me. And there's a huge total pressure loss, that is it loses energy across the shock. You always lose total pressures across shocks. And so the total pressure after the shock, PO2, divided by the total pressure in front of the shock, located in the diffuser, can also be measured or estimated. Let's say that PDO divided by P0 is the total pressure across the diffuser. Now, typically, eta sub D will be greater than one in supersonic wind tunnels, but in hypersonic wind tunnels, we'll find eta sub D less than one. This is strange, but accepted in the communities. For now, because we haven't talked about hypersonic flows, let's focus only on the supersonic problem. In the supersonic wind tunnels, in practice, A sub T2 will always be greater than A sub T1. Why is that? Well, you might imagine that the entropy generation inside the tunnel causes, of course, total pressures, temperatures perhaps, to go down in the flow. Therefore, those ratios, total pressure has gone down while the back pressure is being maintained. And therefore, you'll need and require a larger A sub T2 to just choke the flow. This is always happening in the diffuser. For example, AT1 here will be less than AT2 here, because of course there are losses in the test section. So now we have actually AT1 soup star and AT2 soup star. The primary driver of the entropy in the tunnels are the shocks and boundary layers in the tunnel. Now we intend in particular to find the ratio of the throat areas of the supersonic wind tunnel. Let's return to our best friend, the conservation of mass or the continuity equation in compressible flow in the semi one dimensional form. It was originally written as rho one e a one u one equals rho two a two U2. Here is we've choked the flow at station 1 and 2. We'll replace those with C1 soup star and C2 soup star. Row 1 will become row 1 star and row 2 will become row 2 soup star. AT1 and AT2, of course, are the areas of the first and second throat. We could also write stars, but we already know they are. Let's rearrange this into a ratio of areas of AT2 over AT1 goes as row 1 soup star C1 soup star over row 2 soup star C2 soup star. That's curious. Now let's assume that the flow is adiabatic. And this means that T soup star is a constant. That means there's no heat transfer in or out of the flow in the wind tunnel. And this is probably fine for steady state operations. And now, using the speed of sound relation, we'll write AT2 over AT1 goes as rho 1 soup star over rho 2 soup star. Why? Because C1 soup star and C2 soup star goes as the square root of gamma R T soup star. T soup star is constant, so C1 soup star and C2 soup star are the same through the tunnel. So 1 over 1, excuse me, C1 soup star over C2 soup star is 1, so we get rid of it. Now we have eight sub t2 divided by a sub t1, the area of the second throat to the first, goes as the choked density in the first throat divided by the choked density in the second throat. Now we can use our equation of state for perfect gas, p equals rho r t, which is of course p soup star equals rho soup star times r times t soup star. Remember, of course, that r, after substitution for rho, will have Rho 1 soup star over Rho 2 soup star goes as P1 soup star over RT1 soup star divided by P2 soup star divided by RT soup star. Recall that R is the gas constant, which will be constant crosses out. 
which we made perfect gas assumption, and T1 and T2 superstar we've already implied are the same. Therefore, row 1 superstar over row 2 superstar goes exactly as, in this particular situation, as P1 superstar over P2 superstar. Pretty simple and straightforward. Let's combine the two relations from the previous page, and you'll see, of course, that A2T over A1T, that ratio for the second throat to the first, goes as P1 superstar over P2 superstar. Try it for yourself. And you'll now find that for optimal operations, the Mach numbers must be unity at the throats, because, of course, they're choked. And that will be the good efficiency, of course. So now we can go back and look at our particular equations as P0 over P goes as a function of gamma and Mach number, which are our most important isentropic flow equations which we previously defined. Now we'll write, instead of P0 over P, we'll give it subscripts at the first and second throat in 297 and 298 respectively. For example, at the first throat we can write P0 1 over P1 soup star goes as 1 plus gamma minus 1 over 2 M1 squared all to the gamma over gamma minus 1 goes as gamma plus 1 over 2 to the gamma minus over gamma minus 1. And the second equation, we can write PO2 divided by P0, P2 star, excuse me, goes as the same equations. Here, M1 and M2 are both 1. We replace them, and of course, we get these values of gamma, which should be very familiar to you. So now we have relations of PO1 divided by P1 and PO2 divided by P2. P1 soup star and P2 soup star are, of course, known. Right, they're the critical conditions at the first and second throat, respectively. Now, unfortunately, PO1 and PO2 may not be necessarily known, but we can find their ratio with respect to area, as you see in 296. I know P1 soup star or P2 soup star. We should probably try and find a ratio between 297 and 298. Let's look at that. You can see now that by combining the two relations on the previous slide, we can find an equation for AT2 the area of the second throat divided by AT1, the area of the first throat, will be for wonderful and isentropic relations as PO1 divided by PO2. This is an equation you might remember. Now, P0, the total pressure within the tunnel, will decrease with increasing entropy. So PO1 is the stagnation temperature in the plenum where the flow starts in the wind tunnel. PO2 might in fact be the total pressure after the losses in the test section at the second throat. So PO1 is not necessarily equal to PO2. If they are equal, of course, then you see AT1 equals AT2, as I showed in the first example of this class, which is wonderful. So theory matches physical description. I love that. In this case, if S increases, of course, indeed, PO1 and PO2 must not be equal. PO2 is being reduced because of the increase of turbulence and bondulars and shocks in the tunnel. There's other flow phenomena that might happen in the tunnel. Perhaps you can take a few moments and think about what those might be yourself. Now you'll see that the second throat must be larger than the first in the particular wind tunnel, according to equation 299, which we just developed. Because, of course, PO2 is less than PO1, that means the ratio is positive and greater than 1. This also means, therefore, physically, AT2 must be greater than AT1 in all realistic operations where isotropy, of course, is not conserved. Now you might also imagine a horrible situation where a wind tunnel with a diffuser might have a throat that's smaller than the first. In this case, equation 299 in this slide duct, AT2 over AT1, will never be able to equal to PO1 divided by PO2, but it would require, of course, PO2 being larger than PO1. But I have no way of raising the total pressure within the tunnel, easily at least. It would be a good trick if I could learn it. Nonetheless, in this case, you'll never have a supersonic test section in these types of supersonic wind tunnels. And that's very unfortunate, but it's a good thing to remember. And since we have variable areas in the wind tunnels, you'll have to think carefully about how to set these areas to achieve the desired supersonic flow that you need. Now, it so happens that the efficiency the efficiency, as you remember, A to sub D, which we just defined a few slides ago, is very strongly sensitive to AT2 in practice. And we can show this through sensitivity analysis, which we will not show in this class. Here I've graphed a particular diffuser on the right of a 
converging diverging section diffuser and it's supersonic to the left it goes through and there's a system of waves shock waves and it terminates somewhere in the diffuser and this represents the starting and choking points of the tunnel here in the right, left the typical way to write diffuser efficiencies is to have an x-axis of at2 and a y-axis of eta sub d. If I graph the efficiency of a typical tunnel, it always goes a curve like this. So you can see somewhere between starting the wind tunnel, that is a low pressure ratio, and the tunnel being choked and supersonic, there's some ratio in there where of course we'll have a maximum efficiency, which is of course where in practice you would want to find and run the tunnel. These efficiency graphs are usually published per tunnel per condition and there will be a little book of them that shows for different Mach numbers of the tunnel of what conditions you might want to examine. Let's talk about starting the tunnel and to start the tunnel we really need to understand the basic theory of shock waves and so for now just imagine that vertical lines represent shock waves in the tunnel. Initially, the tunnel is in like figure 110. This is my sketch of the basic tunnel. We have a plenum. We have a first nozzle, AT1, to choke the flow and create a supersonic flow in the test section. And we have a second throat, which we would call the diffuser. And it'd be at Mach 1, and we return to Mach 0. That's what we want. So for small tunnels, usually, as the video you might have seen earlier in the class, in which I posted on the website, you'll see a tiny, tiny little valve is indeed released. Then the uh, normal shock. A normal shock forms as soon as we hit the transonic condition at the first throat. And that normal shock will propagate down the tunnel and through the diffuser and recirculate around the tunnel. 8 sub T2 must be large enough, the area at the diffuser must be large enough to allow the initial flow disturbances, that is in this case the shock and other flow characteristics, from the valve opening, which raises the pressure ratio to start the tunnel, for it to go down the tunnel. And we'll talk more about shocks and these moving shocks later in the class. And of course, once you do that, you'll have to drive the shock out and obtain, of course, the isentropic condition. We'll talk more about this in detail in the shock part of the class. Now, some notes about shock propagations and efficiency of particular diffusers. We'll make just a few observations, which I'll note from experiments and many years of wind tunnel research. The first is the flow in the diffusers is often turbulent and very chaotic, and that means it has a large measure of disorder. It is highly three-dimensional, and the theories we developed here are one-dimensional with, of course, a varying area, and they're isentropic. We do not take into account the three-dimensional nature of the flow, like in the corners of the diffuser, or perhaps instability waves growing, the turbulence in the boundary, these are all three-dimensional effects. Maybe there's even a swirl in the tunnel. It is filled with oblique shocks in the convergent part of the diffuser section. As I showed as these particular little checkered board lines in the upper right of figure 109 on this view graph. Indeed, the design is usually involved in many high-performance supercomputing simulation using numerics in computational fluid dynamics. Then they'll still go and do trial builds and fix errors. Some people say this is a bit of a dark art, if you will, and you might consider magic to design a really excellent high-efficiency diffuser, which ultimately is measured as A to sub D divided by A sub T2 for a range of Mach numbers that the wind tunnel might be using. Here's one last picture from NASA.gov, one of the NASA wind tunnels, of a particular tunnel. On the left you see a technician and you'll see a number of hydraulic rams which change the shape of the entire tunnel. In this case, it's a planar wind tunnel. The back face and front face, which is off the tunnel for visualization purposes to see the wind tunnel interior, is removed. So there's actually a back face and a front face on this tunnel, and the whole test section shape can, of course, be changed to get the area ratios correctly. We're looking from the upstream direction in the upper right, that's the plenum. The flow moves from upper right to lower left, and it goes through a minimum area where my cursor is moving. And then it moves downstream and you see there's a cone in the wind tunnel, that's the test device. 
This technician is there, of course, just for visualization purposes to give you an idea of scale. The flow, of course, goes downstream through a second set of a converging diversion diffuser to bring it through a recirculating pattern. You can see this particular tunnel can have any area ratio, AT1, to the test section area, A sub test by changing, of course, the shape of the tunnel. The shape of these, the actual shape beyond the area ratio, is carefully designed to minimize separation. You can see that the tunnel wall itself is a very, very smooth steel, so that there's no disturbances caused by the tunnel wall. If even a little notch or burr in the metal occurs, then it'll create a shock waves and mock waves and turbulent disturbances on the tunnel wall, which will corrupt the measurement. And so the tunnel walls are very smooth without any lines or problems, if you will. Tunnels like this are adjusted very carefully. One story is if you can put one of these hydraulic rams in too much uh, tension or compression, if you will, then it actually will snap the metal. And so each one is moved individually one at a time to achieve the desired shapes. Using the basic theory we learn here for isentropic flow, you can calculate the test section of this wind tunnel. Take the cross-sectional area at the throat and the cross-sectional area at the test section. Find their ratio and solve for Mach number using the area Mach number relation. And you'll see the test Mach number for this exact test. This is one reason why pictures of supersonic wind tunnels, especially during the Cold War, were closely guarded because no one wanted the other side, if you will, to know what test Mach numbers they were examining because it might be a clue of what Mach numbers of their aircraft they're trying to study. In this class, we looked at particular supersonic wind tunnels, their operation through isentropy, we looked at their diffusers in depth, and we defined the, of course, tunnel efficiency. We then talked about losses and shocks and all the three-dimensional effects and other things that are happening in a tunnel, and an easy way to account for them with the area pressure relation for a supersonic tunnel. In the future classes, we'll start transitioning to shocks. Thank you very much for your time today. I'm Professor Steve Miller.